Amen. I, I like that song because it fits appropriately into what we have been talking about. Thanks, Danielle, for sending us that song. What what's Morgan is talking about is the fact that Jesus paid it all. That's just it. He paid the entire price for us. It has nothing to do with who we are as individuals. But Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. He bore the cross. He endured the punishment for you and I. Jesus paid it all. And as you look at the book of Galatians, that's all that Paul is talking about. He is saying that it's not according to our works, but it is according to our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. But it says, you, Judaizers, you, you've shown up. And as you've shown up, you began to talk about this other stuff. You, you contaminated the gospel. You've added stuff to the gospel. But say, it's not like that. It says, in you Galatians, I am just so amazed that you fell for it. <laughs> you turned so quickly from the God who expressed his love to you via grace in Jesus the Christ. For this gospel, which is not really a gospel. It's just contamination. Put that on my screen, man. It's just, it's, it's just contamination. So then the question is, what is the gospel? Y'all knew I was going to ask you that, didn't you? What's the gospel? We're going to have to keep having our pop quiz until we all get it. What's the, what's the gospel? Mm-hmm. Good news that Christ died. He was buried. And he rose. That's it. That's it. That, that, those, those three little simple things. The good news that Jesus died for our sins because we were the one who did it. We were the one who committed the sin. We were the one who transgressed the law. And we, in and of ourselves, we do not have the power to overcome the sin. So Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. They placed him inside of a real tomb. They didn't take his body down and run off to some foreign country with it. They placed it in the tomb. Rolled a stone in front of it. Placed Roman guards in front of it. <laughs> but on the third day morning, he was raised with all power in his hands. Amen. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Yes, they're trying to contaminate it, but that's the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're trying to add things to it, but Paul says, no, that's the gospel. In fact, this gospel which I have been preaching to you, let me tell you why it's not contaminated. Because I wasn't here to try to please man. Mm -hmm. I didn't come and give you some watered down portion of the gospel. I gave you direct revelation from God. I spent three years in Arabia. I didn't immediately run back to Jerusalem where all the action was at Andre. He says, I spent three years in Arabia. When I was sitting here in Arabia, I was receiving direct revelation from God. He was showing me how all of this stuff worked. He was taking me to another level. He was allowing me to go deeper in my understanding of what all this stuff is about. Mm -hmm. But not only that, look at what he says. He says, and it's the same gospel, number three, that Peter preaches. <laughs> the same God via the same Holy Ghost who revealed the gospel unto me when I was in Arabia, it's the same God who revealed the same gospel unto Peter. So at that Jerusalem council, when Peter stands up and says, hey, God 
has given the same spirit, the same salvation to the Jews that he gave to us. So I don't see why we're treating them any different while we're putting these additional laws onto them. He says it's the same thing. And Paul is telling the church in Galatia, or the churches in Galatia, it's the same gospel. So anybody who says anything different, they should be accursed. <laughs> they should be condemned. It's the same gospel. Amen? All right, amen, amen, amen. All right, so that brings us to the second chapter of the book of, or the letter of Galatians. Second chapter in this letter to the churches in Galatia. Today we're starting at verse number 11. Galatians, the second chapter. Look at what he says in verse number 11. But when Cephas, a.k.a. Peter, came to Antioch, Antioch being one of the churches in Galatia, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Y'all get that? <laughs> he said, I condemned, I put him in check. Right there in his face. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas, my road dog, my missionary partner, the one who came to Tarsus, Pick me up and says, I need you to come help me in Antioch, spread the gospel. Even he turned. It was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that there were no straightforward they were, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, if, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners is in Christ, then, a, then uh, sinners is Christ then a minister of sin. That's a tongue twister for me. May it never be. Go back to what? Go back to 16 and 17. Look at that word in there. He keeps saying the same word over and over and over. Y'all catch that? Justified. He uses the word justified four times right here in this little passage. And then with this in this entire letter, he uses the word justified, I think it's like six or seven times. As you're reading your Bibles and as you're at home studying, I just want to encourage you that when you see a series of words like this piled on top of one another, pay attention. Let the question mark go above your head. Why is he saying the same thing over and over? And what emphasis is he trying to make? Amen. Look at what he says next. Verse number 18. For if I reveal what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law. So I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. In that life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Look at 19 and 20. What's that word right there that they keep, that they keep repeating? Live. Over and over and over again. 
He uses that word live six times or some variation of it. Live, live, lives, life. I'll now live. I live by. Once again, if I was, I would be circling those kind of words or underlining those words because he's trying to make a point. He's trying to emphasize something in this particular text. Amen. So this morning, I just want to talk to you about justification by faith. Justification by faith. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for who you are in our lives, God. Thank you for being our King and our Lord, God. Thank you for being our Master. Thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you continue to do for us, Father God. It's preaching time. And we need a word from you, Father God. Shower your wisdom down upon us. Open up our eyes and our ears so that we may understand what you would have for us, Father God. Open up the deep revelations that's in your word, Father God. We want to rain a word from you. <laughs> we want a word that's going to take us to another level. Help draw us closer to thee. Help us walk in your, in your, in your strength and in your power and your might, Father God. So open it up and make it plain, make it clear. I surrender myself unto thee. You have your way. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So let's jump right into this. As we look at this text, we have a confrontation. Paul checks Peter. <laughs> look back at it. Look at verse number 11. Look at what happens. He says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Paul says, I put him in place. I checked him. I said, Peter, what are you doing? You out here acting like you're brand new. You're tripping, Peter. He says, now before these Jews showed up, this delegation from Jerusalem showed up, you were over here eating with the Gentiles. You had some pork chops, some fat bat, some hog moths, some neck bones, some black eyed peas. You were eating all that stuff right here with them before this crew showed up. But once this delegation showed up, you start tripping, Peter. You get up from the table. You act like you hadn't been eating here. You act like you didn't know them. Peter, what's wrong with you, brother? Why, why, why are you selling out like that? And I can just imagine Peter in his mindset wondering, what if they go back? And tell the people back in Jerusalem that I've been eating unclean food with unclean people. I'm a Jew. I'm not supposed to fellowship with them like that. <laughs> I'm supposed to abstain from certain kinds of food. And yeah, it was cool for me to do it right here. I'm trying to hang out with them right here. I don't want to make them feel bad. don't want to be rude. But when these folks show up, I can't be seen eating like that. And I might lose my position in the church for doing that. I may lose my power. I may lose my authority in the church for being seen doing something like this. Peter was afraid. And Peter was holding on to his traditional mentality. Although Peter had been converted and give his life to Christ, there was still some of that old stuff on the inside of him. There was still some of that Jewish traditions on the inside of him. So he was trying to straddle the fence. <laughs> when I'm in Jerusalem, I'm going to be like the Jews in Jerusalem. But when I'm over here in Antioch, I'm going to be like them over here in Antioch and, and, and eat like that. But in essence, Peter wasn't standing strong on his principles. Because we understand what Paul says. 
But Peter was saying, oh, when somebody over here shows up, I'm just going to change my whole thing. I'm going to be a chameleon. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to change my colors every time I find myself in a different situation. There's folks sitting in the barbershop, sitting in the beauty salon, and they say the same thing about you and I. They say, I don't go to church because everybody in the church is just a hypocrite. The church is full of hypocrites. On Friday night, they out with me. (laughs) On Sunday morning, they in the church. When they are at the job, they gossiping just as much as I'm gossiping. They stir up just as much trouble as I stir up. Their life looks no different than my life. But they always over here trying to tell me what I need to do. How I need to give my, they ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. And to be real, some of them are just using that as an excuse. They really don't want to come to church. But we've given them a reason to say, I ain't got to go because they phony over there. And they, and, they, and they hypocrites over there. But in reality, some of that is true. Some of us are living two lives. We live one life on Sunday. <laughs> but the other days of the week, we got this other lifestyle. Out of the same mouth comes blessings and curses. Sometimes it's known in the four little words. <laughs> we use the big ones. And it's not a slip up. That's just how we talk around a certain set of friends. <laughs> it just flows out and it flows out. And then we turn around and we say, man, you need to come to church with me. So here's my challenge to you. Be committed to the things of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're all in on Sunday, be all in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Are we saying you have to be perfect? No. But it's the commitment level that we're talking about. It's not the slip up. It's when we intentionally continue to do things that we know are contrary. Think about who we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. You've been seeing that, hearing that term on TV all week as they're going through these trials on, on TV. An ambassador represents somebody. The ambassador for the United States represents the president of the United States in all affairs. When he goes to a foreign country or she goes to a foreign country, she speaks on behalf of the president with the same authority as the president. So when we show up and we start talking, they're looking at us as that's an ambassador for Christ. <laughs> and then when we let them long words come out of our mouth, <laughs> that's the ambassador acting like that. <laughs> when we show up with our bottle at the party, that's the ambassador doing that. Right? Right, 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 right. When we at the job gossiping, that's the ambassador that's talking about everybody. When we start lying and we know we lying, everybody else know we lying, that's the ambassador <laughs> doing that. When we say, we're just going to fudge the truth just a little bit. You know, it ain't really wrong. We're just going to fudge it just a little bit because we need to get this done right here. You ain't got to be holy every day, 
That's the ambassador once again saying that. <laughs> Ambassadors for Christ represent Christ. So can we live our lives accordingly? There's a spotlight on you. Mm -hmm. There's a light on you. There's a, there's a spotlight. And people want to know, before you open your mouth, <laughs> what's your lifestyle, baby? Mm -hmm. How is the ambassador living? If you're living it, then you can talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. And Paul, Paul is telling Peter, live it. You stood up at the Jerusalem Council and you said these words. Look at you, man. You know. You was there. The Cornelius thing. You know about that. But you acting differently. Come on, man. Be committed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are an ambassador. Amen. All right, all right. Let's jump back into the conversation. Let's jump back into the conversation. I think he ends this personal testimony point right here at verse number 14. And then Paul picks back up and begins to educate. He makes this smooth transition like all teachers would make into talking about what his testimony is talking about, what, what it shows here. Look at what he says in verse number 15. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith and in Christ, and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Go to that Bible app on your phone for me real fast. Amen. Once again, look at all those words justified. If you have one of those Bible apps on your phone, go to, the, go, to, go to Galatians, the second chapter. Go to verse number 15 and pull up the message version. Pastor, why you say that? Because as you're reading this, did it not sound kind of convoluted to you? It wasn't one fluid sentence, but he stopped, added some stuff, came back, said the same thing, turned right back around again. Go to Ephesians, not, not Ephesians, but Galatians, the second chapter. Look at verse 15 and 16. Listen to what it says. That's NIV. I won't mess it. There we go. There we go. 15. See, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it. And we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trying to be good. See, he kind of talks in our modern day English with that. As you're at home studying, as you're looking at stuff, as you're reading your version, if it's a King James, a New American Standard, an ESV, they try to go as close as they can to what the original Greek was. But sometimes those sentences can be kind of convoluted and backwards. If you have that Bible app, just boom. New living transition. What, what does that say? Yeah, yeah. HCSB, home and concise state. But what does that say? Oh, what does it say in the message version of the same thing? Then it can help you kind of get a better understanding what he's trying to say without having to know all of that Greek. Y'all with me? But Bible study tip, Bible study tip. Y'all can pay me for that one later. All right, all right, all right, all right. So look at what he says now. Listen to what he's saying. He says, we... He's talking to the Galatians again now. He says, yes, we are Jews by nature. We were born into a covenant relationship with God. Yes, we are the chosen people, the people that God has set up so that the world can look at us and see how to have a relationship with God. Yes, that's who we are. And yes, you, 
Gentiles. You give me to punch him in the face. Y'all sinners. You guys are unclean. But we who are Jews, we know that this law that we receive via Moses, it can't save us. It cannot justify us. Trust me, we've been trying for years and years and years to live according to the law as a means of justification. But it is not working. So now that Jesus has come, Jesus is the means by which we are justified. And the same Jesus not only justifies us, he justifies you Gentiles also. Not the law, but Jesus and justification. So he, he, he said that word four or five times. So I thought we, apropos, we, we start talking about that. What is justification? Go to that next screen for me. Go to the next one, Nehemiah. Look at what Rain, Rain Gruden says, uh, Andre. An instantaneous legal act of God in which he, he being God, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us and declares us to be righteous in his sight. Righteous means that you being you're in a good standing with God. Got it? So simply put, this means to be made righteous. When somebody says that you are justified, what they're saying is that you have been placed in a good standing with God. Now, all the little technical terms of what the system I thought, that's theologian's definition, but if you need the working man's definition, I have been made right with God. Simple, simply put. That's it. Right? Y'all with me? Uh, you, you may hear some people say that justification means that the demands of the law have been met. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the definition I want you to get is this one. I've been made to be made righteous. Mm -hmm. All right. Y'all with me? Okay. So then what is that instantaneous legal act of God? It's the cross. Jesus satisfied the demands of the law via the cross. The cross of Calvary. The law said that blood must be shed. Right? It says that there's no forgiveness of sins unless blood is shed. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, our blood was not sufficient because it is tainted with sin. So God needed a lamb without spot or wrinkle to pay the price for us. And that's Jesus. For well, as Jesus' blood is shed on the cross, the demands of the law that blood must be shed are met. Are y'all with me? Let me do a demonstration. Let me do a demonstration. Let me do a demonstration. Come here, Shayla. 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 Come here, Dexter. Stay right here for a second, Shayla. Now, see, Dexter. De Dexter, is a, Dexter is a make believe now, he's a cruel dude. He done some stuff he had no business doing. As a result, pick your coat back up. As a result of that, right? As a result of that, he finds himself in court, right? Now, as he stands before the judge, Andre, they're holding, stand right here, you're the judge. They're holding a trial. A bench trial. But as they're going through this bench trial, it's quite obvious 
that Dexter is guilty. He did it. Ain't no getting around. We're just doing this so we find some type of technicality that he may get off on. But it's quite obvious it was you. <laughs> they got eyewitness testimony, they got video testimony, they got DNA. They know it was you that was there. Note your twin, but you. <laughs> they sound like some of us, don't they? It wasn't me. <laughs> but there's a lawyer in the house. And the lawyer says, yes. I know my client is guilty. And I know he did it wrong. But then the client, but the lawyer by the name of Jesus <laughs> stands in front of the judge known as God. And she says, I know my client is guilty. But I am willing to pay the price for my client. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything wrong. It's not my fault. But I'll pay the price for the client. <laughs> so, so, so then as the lawyer goes to the cross, <laughs> the price is being paid. And as they nail her hands, in this case, to the cross. Y'all with me? The sins from the sinner are applied to the lawyer, to Jesus. Now, once again, Jesus didn't do anything wrong, but that red blood that was shed on the cross is meeting the demands of the law. So now Dexter, who is guilty as all outdoors, is forgiven yeah. of his sin. <laughs> but not only is he forgiven, he is given rights that were afforded to Jesus because Jesus was perfect and Jesus had his own righteousness, right? So now, big, big word. His righteousness is imputed to Dexter. <laughs> Easy word. Transferred to Dexter. <laughs> Dexter didn't do anything to earn it, but uh, because of the grace of God, God said, I'll send my son, Jesus the Christ, to bear the cross. And now because of that, not only is he forgiven, but he's righteous. <laughs> <laughs> when God looks at him give me Jesus no longer does he see Dexter and all that black but all he sees is the blood that's it that's all he sees now Dexter doesn't have to walk around with his shoulders hung down with his head low and shame and guilt and regret, feeling bad about him. But he can walk around now with his head high, his shoulders back. It's just because he knows that he's been forgiven of God via Jesus on the cross. The demands of the law have been met. Dexter is justified. Make sense now? Dexter is justified. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all Paul is trying to say in 15 and 16. He says, the means are met not by the law, but according to the blood of Jesus Christ. You are justified by what Jesus did on the cross. <laughs> not by obeying the law that these Judaizers keep coming in and trying to do. They're contaminating this original gospel that I gave you by telling you stuff that's not true. It's the blood. You're justified according to the blood. All right, all right. Look at what he says next. Look at what he says next. 
go to verse number 19. So for, for through the law, I died to the law. Huh? Huh? Makes sense, right? For through, what you mean? We're going to come back and get it. For through the law, did that, did that kind of confuse anybody? For through the law, I died to the law. <laughs> so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. I wasn't there, but I've been crucified with him. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Pay attention to this last verse. I do not nullify, I do not cancel the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, <laughs> then Christ died needlessly. Well, your, some of your Bibles might say Christ died in vain. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go back and get that. All right. Let's go back and get that. that verse, verse 19. He's talking about through the law, Christ died. I mean, the law, the law was died, right? He said through the law. Let me read it again if I mess it up. Verse 19. So what do you say? He said, for through the law, I died to the law. <laughs> through the law, I, hold on. What are you talking about? How can you die from the same thing that was holding you back? Because Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. You got where he's coming from? It says, through the law, yes, something had to be done. There was some demands that were taking place. But through the law, I became free. I met those demands of the law because Jesus paid the price. Now I am crucified with Christ. In other words, as they nailed his, him to the cross, they nailed me and my sins to the cross. And the guilt that comes along with it, the shame that comes along with it, the regret that comes along with it, the bondage that comes along with it. The fear of condemnation that comes along with it. He nailed all of that stuff to the cross. Now, as a result of me understanding what he did for me on the cross, I no longer live for myself. But I live for Jesus. Who died and rose again on my behalf. Go to, go to Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans, the 12th chapter. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Romans, the 12th chapter. Ooh, look, Romans 12. And right there in verse number 1 and 2. And if you can do me a favor here, right there in your margins beside Romans 12, 1, write Galatians 2, 19 through 21. And then when you're at home doing some self-study one day, you read through that and you're going to say, hold on, I wrote this note. Because the two go together. Romans 12, 1 is the result of what took place and what Paul was talking about in Galatians 2.21. Does that make sense? Basically, we're just, we're just doing some cross-referencing. So what took place, what, what Paul's going to say now is the result of what happened over there in Galatians. Look at this. Look at what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brethren... By the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says the least you can do. The least we can do. It's to live our lives before him acceptable because of all he did for us on the cross. Because we have been justified. The least we can do is to live our life for him. Look at how he says it in another verse. Look at um, 2 Corinthians. This is the one I love. I just love this one here. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I think this is one of Mama's favorites too. Mama Jones' favorites. 
I would put that same note if I was you. Galatians. I even got some more in here. I got Colossians 3:12 through 13. I wrote in my Bible. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. Uh, some other notes I wrote in my Bible. But look at what it says. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse number 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Some of your Bibles may say compels us or constraineth us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all die. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. He says, the love of Christ controls me. Compels me. Constraineth me. Why? Because I know what he did for me on the cross. I have been justified. He met the demands of the law. He gave his life. I am in deserving of eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. But he died on the cross for my sins. I deserve to be condemned. But he died on the cross for my sins. And now I'm just grateful. <laughs> so grateful I say, I'm going to live my life for him. Now get what he's saying now. He's not saying I need to live my life according to the ritual legalistic part of it. He says no longer do I have to live my life according to the law. Mm -hmm. As a means of salvation. Or should I say all of it. He says I don't have to sit here and live my life in order and obey each and every tittle of the law in order for me to be made righteous. In order for me to be in a good standing with the law. If I mess up, that does not mean I'm automatically going to be going to, to, to hell, to Hades. <laughs> right? Right. That, that, that's not what that means. He says, I am no longer bound by that law. Because I've received, verse 21, grace. And it is the same grace that saved me. It's the same grace in which I live by day after day after day after day. It's the same grace that picks me up after I've fallen. The same grace that dusts me off. The same grace that encourages me to get back into the game. The same grace that kind of empowers me. The same grace that makes me an overcomer. The same grace that makes me more than a conquering Christ Jesus. It's that grace, not my works, not my obedience to the law, but it's according to grace. Grace takes me from level to level to level to level. Not my human effort. You got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. Not my human effort. But the grace of God. What happens to a lot of us, we get saved by grace. Then we start trying to live by works. We get saved by grace. And then we try to live according to the law. But we can't live according to the law because we can't fulfill all the things in the law. And then we start feeling bad about ourselves after we do something crazy and we stop coming to church. We stop trying to walk in the glory of God. We start beating ourselves up. But Paul says you don't live according to the law. You don't get saved by grace, then walk by law. You get saved by grace, and you walk by grace. Day in, day out. Not by might, nor by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. Linda, every day live by grace. Every day, Michelle, live by grace. Every day, Andre, every day, Danielle, live by grace. With the understanding that I can't do this thing on my own. But Christ, mm -hmm. 
He did something for me over 2,000 years ago that allows me to walk in his power, walk in his strength. Now I'm now, I can't go there, we'll talk about that next week. I'm now a joint heir. But it's according to grace. Not because I'm such a good person, but grace. Not because of my human effort, but grace. Not because I'm so smart, but grace. Not because I have so much money in the bank, but grace. Not because I can manipulate situations, but grace. Not because of the job I have, but grace. Not because I'm better than somebody else, what Paul is trying to tell them. But it's the same grace that was afforded to us, the chosen people, the Jews, has been afforded to you, the Gentiles. Don't allow anybody else to come and add anything on to God's grace. Live the grace. So when the enemy gets in your ear and starts talking to you and trying to condemn you, tell him grace. Tell him grace. <laughs> tell him grace. Tell him grace. And as a matter of fact, tell him, tell him this verse right here. Go back to Galatians. And I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to shut it down. I'm getting excited. Galatians 2. This is one I would try to memorize. 220. Look at what it says. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Just, just put that into you. Just put that into your spirit. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me. That's it. Put that into your spirit some kind of way. That's it. And every time the enemy comes to you, you tell him that verse. <laughs> every time you start beating yourself up, you go to that verse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every time you feel like being selfish, say, uh-uh, it's not for me, it's for Christ. Every time you feel like you can't accomplish something, uh-uh, in Christ. Woo! In Christ. Through the grace of God, I can do it. Through the grace of God, I'm forgiven. Through the grace of God, I'm an overcomer. I'm not slum. But I'm somebody in Christ Jesus. I no longer live for myself, but for him. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you. We just thank you for who you are in our lives, God. We thank you for being our king and our Lord, God. We thank you for being our master. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you continue to do for us, God. We thank you for your love and your grace. And your grace. <laughs> and more grace. And more grace and more grace and more grace God we just thank you for it God God help us receive the revelation you've given us today Father God bury this one into our hearts Father God good soil good seed good fertilizer good watering Father God this one needs to grow Father God I, I, I just pray a special blessing over here for all of them, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Allow them to understand the grace, Father God. The grace, the grace. You revealed it unto me, and it just blew my mind, Father. Show them the way you showed me what this grace thing is talking about. Help us understand it. Bring it back to our memory banks, Father God. The frustrating times, bring it back. When we're beating ourselves up, bring it back. When we're condemning ourselves, bring it back. When other people try to condemn us, bring it back. Understand the grace that we've been justified by faith. God, we love you. And we honor you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen.